Well, <coughs> in spite of the obvious stature of a Washington and a Jefferson and Virginia settlement 13 years pre-Pilgrim, the southern states lagged behind the scribbling northerners in fashioning a comprehensive colonial myth to highlight their own cultural ascendancy in the new world. All right, so there was two narratives being taken root here. Southern states lagged behind this, the northerners' comprehensive colonial myth. In what way? to highlight their own cultural ascendancy. So I guess the factory industrial age distinguished the North in this sense in the new world because the South is still relying on agriculture. Okay, here's what we have. Less a story than a mystery. It is, right? It's a mystery. There persists to this day a morbid curiosity about the 1587 lost colony of Roanoke, a puzzle on the order of Amelia Earhart's disappearance over the Pacific. I never heard of her. A strange allure surrounds every vanishing people. Recall the widely popular television series Lost or Plato's Atlantis, ghost ships and ghost colonies invoke a marvelous sense of timelessness. They exist outside the normal rules of history, which explains why Roanoke mystery mitigates the harsh realities we instinctively know the early settlers were forced to face. In Roanoke, it's a tantalizing curio of a lost world. Jamestown, its most permanent offspring, grew a res grew to represent the Virginia colony origin in a way that could compete with the uplifting story of the Pilgrims. The 1607 founding of Jamestown may lack a national holiday, but it does claim a far sexier fable in the dramatic rescue of John Smith by the Indian princess Pocahontas. As the story goes, in the middle of an elaborate ceremony, the 11-year-old beloved daughter of King Powhatan, he rushed forward and placed her head over Smith, stopping tribesmen from smashing his skull with their clubs, a magical bond formed between the proud Englishman and the young naive cutting through all the linguistic and cultural barriers that separated the old and new worlds. This brave girl was fascinated. Poets, playwrights, artists, and filmmakers. She has been called the patron deity of Jamestown and the mother of both Virginia and America. A writer in 1908 dubiously claimed that Pocahontas was actually the daughter of Virginia Dare the youngest member of the Roanoke colony, making the Indian princess of child of European descent, lost in the wilderness, much like Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzans of the Apes, published three years later. <clears throat> the best known, most recent version of the story is the 1995 Walt Disney animated film. Strikingly beautiful, unnervingly buxom, and the most like a popular culture diva than a member of the Sinop. Konopat tribe. What's the name of this? Don't even attempt. So this is the tribe Pocahontas was in. Disney Pocahontas fabulously communes with nature, befriending a raccoon talking to a tree. She is nearly identical to other Disney heroines, Snow White and Cinderella, who also boast a uh, menagery of animal friends. Why? Communing with nature draws upon the potent romantic image of the new world as a prelapsarian, classless society. 
Prelapsian means a time or state before the fall of humankind. Old tropes meld seemingly with new cinematic forms. This is how they're doing it in sorcery. This is a sorcery right here. It's tropes that's melded in seamlessly with new cinematic forms or real life events. Women in the Western culture have been consistently portrayed as closer to mother nature, lushness and abundance. A dentist, tranquility and fertility. There is no rancid swamps, no foul diseases and starvation. And in this Jamestown recreation, <clears throat> scholars have debated whether the rescue of Smith ever took place since only his account exists and its most elaborate version was published years after Pocahontas' death. Smith was a military adventurer, a self-promoter, a commoner, who had the annoying habit of exaggerating his exploits. His rescue story perfectly mimicked a popular Scottish ballad of the day in which the beautiful daughter of a Turkish prince rescued an English adventurer who was about to lose his head. Though an Anglican minister presided over Princess Pocahontas' marriage to the planter, John Rolfe, one member of the Jamestown Council dismissed her as the heathen spawn of a cursed generation and labeled her a barbarously mannered girl. Even Ruff considered the union a conveniently political alliance rather than a love match. We should not expect Disney to get that right when the fundamental principle of the classless American identity, sympathetically communion, is at stake. Sympathetic communions classless American identity. <laughs> the film builds on another mythic strand of often told tales. It is a John Smith, blind and dr drowning in his animated forms, not Rolf, who's taking on the role of Pocahontas' lover, exaggerating her beauty and highlighting her choice to save Smith and become an ally of the English is not new. <laughs> When a less than flattering portrait appears in 1842, making her plump and ungainly, the not and lovely petite Indian princess, there was a storm of protest over what one critical called a coarse and unpoetical rendering her angelicized, Anglic anglicized beauty is non negotiable. A primitive elegance makes her assimilation tolerable. Indeed, it is all that makes exception, acceptance of the Indian maiden possible. So this is all prim, primitive elegance. <laughs> and they only created this to assimilate her beautifully into the wovenness of their acceptance of the Indians through love, matrimony, then we can always believe that, okay, if we want to get in good with white people, we'll just marry in with them. To ensure your survival. <laughs> the, Hocopon the Pocahontas story requires the princess to reject her own people and culture, you see? And this is how they implant this in the woman to this day. Black women and black men how, how to automatically disown their own race. They won't admit it, but this is what they're doing. But this has been learned behavior just by how they told these fables and fairy tales and stuff about outsiders, how pergamous relationships are, uh, misogynation and things like this. This powerful theme has persisted as the historian's, historian Nancy Shoemaker observes because it contributes to the larger national rationale of the Indians willing participation in their own demise. You see, are they able to change the story up? You don't think that they would have misconstrued about the blacks too? So they tell, put more emphasis on the Africans selling us than us fighting in those neighboring villages against the white settlers. They don't tell about the the riots and the rebels, how we rebelled and stuff. 
like we just willfully went with them because we were already captive. This is how they make it already seen <laughs> by robbery uh, tribes and stuff. Willing participation in their own demise. <laughs> yeah, this young girl did not willingly live at Jamestown. She was taken captive in the garden paradise of early Virginia that never was. War and suffering, greed and colonial concourse are conveniently missing <clears throat> in this story, right? Class and cultural dissonance magically fades from view in order to remake American origins into a utopian love story. This is all sorcery. I want y'all to know this as well. My spirit is just trying to get y'all to see what is sorcery in their social behaviors, these caste and cultural dissonances, and the denials of recognizing reality. It's all sorcery. Can we handle the truth? That's the question we need to be asking y'all white people today. In the early days of the settlements, in the prophet driven minds of well-connected men in charge of a few prominent joint stock companies. America was conceived of in paradoxical terms. At once, a land of fertility and possibility and a place of outstanding waste. Rank and weedy backwaters, dank and sorry swamps. Here was England's opportunity to thin out its prisons and siphon out off thousands. Here was an outlet for the unwanted a way to remove vagrants and beggars and to get rid of London's eyesore population. Those sent on hazardous voyages to America who survived presented a simple purpose for empirical profiters, profiteers to serve English interests and perish in the process. In that sense, the first common commerce as they were known before the magical pilgrims took hold were something less than an inspired lot Dozens who disembarked from the Mayflower succumbed that first year to starvation and disease linked to vitamin deficiency. Vitamin D, pellagra disease, omega fats and stuff like this. Scurvy rotted their gums and they bled from different orifices. Ugh. And by the 1630s, New Englanders re reinvented a hierarchical society of stations. So social stations in society based on class. From ruling elites to household servants in their numbers, there are plenty of poor boys meant for exploitation. Some were religious but they were in the major minority among the waves of migrants that followed Withrop's Arbella. The elites owned Indian and African slaves. This is the stations, elites and servants. They owned Indian and African slaves but the population they most exploited were their child laborers. Even in the church reflected class relations. And didn't I just read that in Hoffman's book yesterday, they were white and slaves, that they were children that they were exploiting in England. And now it's been cooperated in this book by another white person. Y'all don't believe it, that she's white? So you know she's telling the truth. Look at her. So trustworthy. I believe you, Nancy. I believe you. <clears throat> Virginia has even less a place of hope. Here were England's rowdy and undisciplined men willing to gamble their lives away, but not ready to work for a living. That's interesting to know. This is in Virginia. This is what the type of men that came here. This is the truth. Oh my God. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. England perceived them as manure for a marginal land. All that these idle men understood was a cruel discipline when it was imposed upon them in the manner of the mercenary John Smith. 
and the last thing they wanted was to work to improve the land. All that would keep the fledgling colony alive was a military-style labor camp meant to protect England's interests in the country's ongoing competition with the equally design designing Spanish, French, and Dutch governments. That a small fraction of colonists survived the first 20 years of settlement came as no surprise back home, nor did London's elite much care. <laughs> the investments was not in people whose already unrefined habits declined over time, whose rudeness magnified in relation to their brutal encounters with Indians. The colonists were meant to find gold and the line the pockets of the investors class back in England. The people sent to accomplish this task were by definition expendable. So now, <laughs> oh my God. So now we know what happens to our colonial history. It is whitewashed. Though new world settlers were supposed to represent the promise of social mobility and the pilgrims generated our hallowed faith in liberty. 19th century American paradoxically created a larger than life cast of democratic royalty. These inheritors bounded the first gene gene genealogical societies in the 1840s. And by the turn of the 20th century, patriotic organizations with an emphasis on heredity descended such as the general society of the Mayflower descendants and the order of the founders and patriots of America. These were hereditary. Hereditary uh, groups. Eugenics. I think this is what they talk about. eugenics groups, heredity, general society of Mayflower descendants, and the order of the founders and patriots of America. They both boasted chapters across the nation. These were, okay, hereditary chapters. That's interesting. Why would they form these? You got to ask yourself this. <laughs> when they all come in here for the same purpose. The highly exclusive Order of the First Families of Virginia was established in 1912. Its members claiming that their lineage could be traced back to English lords and Lady Rebecca Roof, who we all know as the ennobled and anglicized Pocahontas. Statues are the companions of elite societies in celebrating paternal lineage and a new aristocracy. They tell us that some families in some classes have a great claim as heirs of the founding promise. Municipal and state leaders have supported the national hagiography. Hagiography is a biography of saint or venerated persons in bold form by constructing grand monuments to our colonial city fathers. The versions of John Withrop that the revolutionary John Adams had favored, dressed in Shakespearean or Tudor stored attire with an ornate rough collar and hose, first graced the back bay of Boston in 1880. But the largest such memorial is the 27 ton statue of William Penn perched atop City Hall in Philadelphia. After it was completed in 1901, no structure in the entire city was permitted to be taller than Penn's Quaker had until 1987, ensuring that the founder's sovereign gaze toward over the city of brotherly love, commemorating the colonizing act of territorial possession. In British law, ownership was measured by standing one's ground, that is holding the and occupying the land. Land itself was a source of civic identity. Land, a source of civic identity. This principle explains as well the total value of Plymouth Rock, the large stone discovered long after the last pilgrim breathed New England's air, Christian in the 18th century, at the first piece of land on which the Mayflower settled stood. 
Commemorations of this kind begs the following question. Who were the winners and losers in the great game of colonial conquest? Beyond parceling the land, how were estates bounded? These are good questions. How were the estates fortune made and labor secured? Some good questions. What social structures, what manner of social relationships did the first European Americans really set in motion? Finding answers to these questions will enable us to fully appreciate how long ago established identities of haves and have nots left a permanent imprint on the collective American mind. This is the context that we need to be act getting uncovering right here. We don't have context to these questions, social structures, the manner of their social relationships. Beyond the parceling of the land, how were their estates bounded, fortunes made, and labor secured? Well, we know they had slavery, but we're talking like the 16th, 17th. Keep going. American sketchy understandings of the nation's colonial beginnings reflect the larger cultural impulse to forget or at least gloss over centuries of dodgy decisions, dubious measures, and outright failures. The lost colony of Roanoke was just one of the many unsuccessful colonial schemes. Ambitious sounding plans for the New World settlements were never more than an ad hoc notion or an overblown provisional promotional track. The recruits for these projects did not necessarily share the beliefs of those principal leaders molded in bronze. The John Withrops and William Penns were lionized for having projected the enlarged destinies of their respective colonies. Most settlers in the 17th century did not envision their forced exile as the start of a city upon a hill. They did not express undying confidence in pen holy experience. Dreamers dropped, but few settlers came to America to fulfill any divine plan. During the 1600s, far from being ranked as valued British subjects, the great majority of early colonists were classified as surplus population and expendable rubbish, a rude rather than robust population. The English subscribed to the idea that the poor dredged would be weeded out of English society in four ways. Either nature would reduce the burden of the poor through food shortages, starvation and disease, or drown into crime. They might end on the gallows. So these were the ways they was with, uh, trying to weed them out. This is how they're going to weed us out today. Crime, the burden of poor through food shortages, starvation and disease, crime. <laughs> Finally, some would be impressed by force or lured by bounties to fight and die in foreign wars or else be shipped off to the colonies. Such worthless drones as these could be removed to colonial outposts that were in short supply of able-bodied laborers and lest we forget young fruitless females once there, it would, was hoped the drones would be energized as worker bees. The bees was the favorite insect of the English, a creature seen as chaste, but more important, highly productive. <laughs> so they compared the woman to a bee, an insect. This is how they thought of women, as an insect. The colonists were a mixed lot. On the bottom of the heap were men and women of poor and criminal classes. Among these unheroic transplants were ruggish highwaymen, mean vagrants, and Irish rebels, known whores, and an assortment of convicts shipped to the colonies for grand larceny or other property crimes. As a reprieve of sorts to escape the gallows, not much less were those who filled the ranks of indentured servants who ranked in class positions from low, lowly street urchins to former artisans burdened with overwhelming debt that had taken a chance in the colonies, having been impressed into service and then choosing exile over possible incarcerations within the walls of an overcrowded, disease-ridden English prison. 
labor shortages led some ship captains and agents to round up children from the streets of London and other towns to sail to planters across the ocean. This is what I just read. So this is just corroborated. So this is true. Y'all were slaves. Oh my God. This was known as spiriting. Spiriting. Spirit fingers. Young children were shipped off for petty crimes. Children, people. One such case is that of Elizabeth Little Bess Armstrong sent to Virginia for stealing two spoons. Large numbers of poor adults and fatherless boys gave up their freedom, selling themselves into indentured servitude, whereby their passage was paid in return for contracting to anywhere from four to nine years of labor. Their contracts might be sold and often were off upon their arrivals, unable to marry or choose another master. They could be punished or whipped at, all, at will. Owing to the harsh working conditions, they had to endure one critic compared their lot to Egyptian bondage. Discharged soldiers also of the lower classes were shipped off to the colonies. Isn't that what I just read in that other book? So this corroborating everything I just read. It. So he wasn't lying, this Hoffman, Michael B. Hoffman. Discharged soldiers as well, also of the lower classes, were shipped off to the colonies. For a variety of reasons, single men and women and families of the lower gentry and those of the artisans or Yemen classes, that's that Yemen again. Y'all are gonna Google this. They joined the masses. Migratory swarms. Some left their homes to evade debt that might well have landed them in prison. Others, a fair number coming from Germany and France, viewed the colonies as an asylum from persecution for their religious faiths. Just as often, resettlements were their escape from economic restrictions imposed upon their trades. Mm -hmm. Still others ventured to America to leave tarnished reputations and economic failures behind. As all students of history know, slaves eventually became one of the largest groups of unfree laborers transported from Africa to the Cari and the Caribbeans, and from there to the mainland British American colonies. Their numbers grew to over 600,000 by the end of the 18th century. Six hundred thousand slaves in one hundred years. They was able to get pe that many people over here. Less than a hundred years, they were able to get. Think of all them ships that were coming in with all them slaves. People, six hundred thousand slaves by the eighteenth century. That's seventeen hundred. That's just a hundred years later. Africans were found in every colony, especially after the British government gave full encouragement to the slave trade when it granted an African monopoly to the companies of royal adventurers in 1663. The slave trade grew even faster after the monopoly ended. As the American colonists bargained for lower prices and purchased slaves directly from foreign vendors. To put class back into the story where it belongs, we have to imagine a very different kind of landscape. Not a land of equal opportunities, but a much less appealing terrain where death and harsh labor conditions awaited most migrants. A firmly entrenched British ideology justified rigid, rigid class stations for the promise of social mobility. Certain, certainly, purity religious faith did not re displace class hierarchies either. The early generations of New Englanders didn't nothing to diminish, let alone condemn the routine reliance on servants or slaves. Land was the principal source of wealth, and those without any had little chance to escape servitude. It was the stigma of landlessness that would leave its mark on white trash from this day forward. So, welcome to America as it was. The year is 1776 is a false starting point for any consideration of American conditions. Independence did not magically erase the British class system, nor did it root out long entrenched beliefs about poverty and the willful exploitation of human labor. An unfavored population, wildly thought of as waste or rubbish, remained dis 
disposable indeed well into modern times. And we're going to go into part one to begin the world anew. Waste people in the new world. In the minds of literate English men and women, as colonization began in the 1500s, North America was an uncertain world, uninhabited by monstrous creatures, a blank territory skirted by mountains of gold. Because it was a strange land that few would ever see firsthand, spectacular tales had more appeal than practical observations. English's two chief promoters of American explorations would never set foot on, on the continent. Richard This guy, the elder, 1530 to 91, was a lawyer at Middle Temple, a vibrant center of intellectual life and court politics in London metropolis. His much younger cousin with the identical name trained at Christ Church, Oxford, and never hazarded, hazarded a, a voyage beyond the shores of France. The elder, Hucklew, was a bookish attorney who happened to be well connected to those who dreamt of profit from overseas ventures. His circle included merchants, royal officials, and such men on the make as Sir Walter Raleigh, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, and Martin Frobisher, all of whom sought fame and glory from exploration. But these men of action were endowed with larger than life egos. There were a new breed of adventurers known for heroism, but also for ill-tempered public behavior. Richard Hucklut, the younger one, was an Oxford fellow and clergyman who devoted his life to compiling the traveling narratives of explorers. In 1589, he published his most ambitious work, Principal Navigations, an exhaustive catalog of all the accounts he could track down of English travelers to the East the North, and of course, America. In the age of Shakespeare, everyone who was anyone read Hucklew. The unstoppable John Smith quoted, quoted liberally from his writings, proving himself more than a brute soldier of fortune. Even before publishing Principal, Principal Navigation, the young Hucklew had sought royal favor. He prepared a treatise for Queen Elizabeth I and her top advisors laying out his working theory of British colonializations. Discourse of Western Plenty, 1584, was pure propaganda designed to persuade the English of the benefit of American settlements. Sure, Walter Rely had commissioned the work, hoping for the state financing he never received when he launched an expedition that led to the short-lived Roanoke colony of Carolina coast. In Halupe, English colonial visions, distant America was a wilderness of an utmost inconceivable dimension. For the French intellectual Michael de Montague in 1580, it was the habitat of a single and uncorrupted people whom he whimsically called cannibals, slyly challenging the popular image of brutes gorging on human flesh. Like Haluk, he had never seen native people, of course. Haluk, at least, was more practical and more an Anglican than Montaigne in his outlook on the aboriginals. He believed them neither dangerous nor innocent, but empty vessels waiting to be filled with Christians and no less commercial truth. He imagined the Indians as useful allies in fulfilling English aspirations, possible tradition, trading partners and subordinates, to be sure but above all, the natural source to be exploited for the greater good. Attaching empty as a metaphor to a mysterious land served the legal purpose of the English state. It's empty over there. Ain't nothing going over in America. It's going on over there. It's empty. <laughs> this is the legal purpose.
because it was empty. <laughs> Without recognized owners, the territory was available and waiting to be taken. Even for the bookish cleric Haluk, the trope of conquest he used presented America as a lovely woman waiting to be wooed and wed by the English. They would become her rightful owners and deserving custodians. It was all the fiction, of course, because the land was not really inane, void, and vacant as the English conceived it. However, any land had to be taken out of its natural state and put to commercial use. Only then would it be truly owned. Obviously, the Indian occupants were deemed unable to possess a true title. Combining ancient laws for convincing analogies, English colonizers classified the natives as savages and sometimes as barbarians. The Indians did not build what the English would acknowledge as permanent homes and towns. They did not enclose the workable grounds inside hedges and fences. Under their tenancy, the land appeared unbounded and untamed. untamed. Well, this is important to, to note this. Now that they're here, they have all this knowledge about tenancy, fencing, hedging. How did they get all this knowledge? We got to ask ourselves. What John Smith in his accounts of Virginia and later in New England described as very rank and weedy. The Indians lived off the earth as passive nomads, profit seeking planters and industrious husbandmen. On the other hand, were needed to cultivate the grounds for its riches and in doing so imposed a firm hand this powerful conception of land use would play a key role in future categorizations of race and class on the ex experimental continent. Before they even established new and busy societies, colonizers, colonizers denoted some people as entrepreneurial stewards of the exploitable land. Entrepreneurial stewards of the exploitable land. They declared others the vast majority as mere occupiers a people with no measurable investments in productivity or in commerce, <laughs> i.e. our Blacks and Indians. Whether barren or empty, uncultivated or rank, the land acquired a quintessentially English meaning. The English were observed with waste, which was why Americans was first and foremost a wasteland in their eyes. Wasteland meant undeveloped land, land that was outside the circulation of commercial exchange and apart from the understood rules of agricultural production. To lie in waste, in biblical language, meant to exist desolate and unattended. In agrarian term, it was to be left fellow and unimproved. Wasteland was idle land. Arable tracts of desirable property could only be associated with fair old fields, rows of crops and fruit trees, golden waves of grain, and pasture for cattle and sheep. John Smith embraced the same ideological premise with a, a precise, if crude, illusion. The Englishman's rights to the land was ensured by his commitment to carpeting the soil with manure. An English elixir of animal waste would magically transform the Virginia wilderness, making untilled wasteland into valuable English territory. Waste was there to be treated and then exploited. Waste was wealth and yet unrealized. In his discourse of Western planting, Haluk confidently describes the entire continent as that waste firm of America, not terra firma, but waste firm. He saw natural resources as raw materials that could be converted into valuable commodities. Like other Englishmen of his day, he equated wastelands with commons forests and fens, those lands that 16th century agrarians and proverbs eyed for prospective profit. Wastelands served the interests of private owners in the commercial marketplace. When the commons was enclosed in sheep and cattle grazed there, Forests could be cut down for timber and cleared for settlements. 
ends or marshes could be drained and reconstructed, reconstituted as rich, arable farmland. It was not just land that could be waste. People could be waste too. And this brings us to our most important point of embarkation. Haluk's American Re America, it required what he classified as waste people. The corpse of laborers needed to cut down the trees, beat the hemp for making rope, gather honey, salt and dry fish, dress raw animal hides, dig the earth for minerals and raising olives and silk and sorts and pack fur feathers. He pictured paupers and vagabond convicts debtors and lusty young men without employment doing all such work. The fry young children of wandering beggars that grow up idly and hurtfully and burden burdenous to the realm might be unladen and better bred up. Merchants would be sent to trade with the Indians selling trinkets, venting cloth goods and gathering more information about the interiors of the continent. Artisans were needed millwrights to process the timber, carpenters, brick makers and plasters to build the settlements, cooks and lauderers and bakers, tailors, cobblers to service the infant colony. Where would these workers come from? The artisans, he felt, would be spread without weakening the English economy. But the bulk of the labor force was to come from the swelling numbers of poor and homeless. They were in Haluk's disturbing illusion, ready to eat up one another, already cannibalizing British economy. Idle and unused, they were waiting to be transplanted to the American lands to be better put to use. This view of poverty was widely shared. One persistent project first promoted in 1580, but never realized involved raising a fleet of a hundred ton fishing vessels comprising 10,000 men, half of whom were to be impoverished vagrants. The gallery labor scheme was designed to beat the famously industrious Dutch at the fishing trade. Liddy mathematicians and geographer John Dee was another who imagined a maritime solution to poverty. In 1577, as the British Navy expanded, he promoted he proposed converting the poor into sailors. Others wished for the indignant to be swept from the streets one way or another, whether gathered up as forced labor, building highways and fortifications or herded into prisons and workhouses. London Bridewell Prisons was chartered in 1553, the first institution of its kind to propose reformations of vagrants. By the 1570s, more houses of corrections had opened their doors. Their founders offered to train the children of the poor to be brought up in labor and work so they would not follow to the, in the footsteps of their parents and become idle rugs. <laughs> so the correctionals were training the children at this prison. <laughs> so they won't become, grow up to be idle rugs. So they were employing the children as well. Wow. <coughs> this is so crazy to me. I'm going to make these videos an hour. I don't want to go longer than that. In this sense, what Haluk foresaw in a colonized America was one giant workhouse. <laughs> this cannot be emphasized enough. As the waste firm of America was settled, it would become a place where the sur surplus poor, the waste people of England, would be converted into economic assets. So that's what they did. This whole country was designed, this matrix, was this designed to satisfy economic assets. So they put factories, first they had the land, agriculture, factories, industrial. The land and the poor could be harvested together 
to add to rather than continue to subtract from the nation's wealth. Among the first waves of workers were the convicts who would be employed at heavy labor, building trees and burning them for pitch, tar, and soap ash. Other would dig to the mines for gold, silver, iron, and copper. The convicts were not paid wages as debt slaves. They were obliged to repay the English Commonwealth for the crimes by producing commodities for export. In return, they would be kept for a life of crime, avoiding, in Haluk's words, mis being miserably hanged or packed into prisons to pitifully pine away and die. As he saw it, the larger rewards would be reaped in the next generations. <laughs> this is what they've been hoping for. Every generation is just going to get better. <laughs> By importing raw goods from the new world and exporting cloth and other commodities in return, the poor at home would find work so that not one poor creature would feel impelled to steal, to starve, and to beg as they do. They would prosper along with the growth of a colonial trade. The children of wandering beggars, having been kept from idleness and made able by their own honest and easy labor, would grow up responsibly without surcharging others. Children who escaped pauperism, no longer burdens on the state, might re-enter the workforce as honest laborers. The poor fry sent overseas would now be better bred up making a lot of the English people better off and the working poor more industrious. It all sounded perfectly logical and real reliable. Seeing the indigent as wash wastrels as the dregs of society was certainly nothing new. The English had waged a war against the poor, especially vagrants and vagabonds for generations. A series of laws in the 14th century led to a concerted campaign to root out this wretched mother of all vices. By the 16th century, harsh laws and punishments were fixed in place. Public stocks were built in towns for runaway servants, along with hipping po whipping posts and cages vigorously placed around London. Whipping posts, hot brandy irons, and ear boring identified this underclass and so she's cooperating that to you remember he said he branded them with the letter r wow so the same thing they did to blacks is the same thing that they did the whites too so this is about elitism this is elitism this is the one percent this is their draconian that we're fighting against because they did this to white people too who are these draconians elitists gotta find them we gotta rule them out. Brandy irons and ear boring identified this underclass. So they chop out the ears too. So this corroborating this oh, and set them apart as criminal contingents. An act of 1547 allowed for vagrants to be branded with a V on their breast and enslaved. What? Of oh, this. So they had branding on them too. Guys, do y'all realize we don't know anything about this history? Yeah. Well, this unusual piece of legislation appears never to have been put into practice. It was nonetheless a natural outgrowth of the widespread vilifications of the poor. By 1584, when Haluk drafted his Discourses of Western Planting, the poor were routinely being condemned as thriftless and idle, a diseased and dangerously mobile, unattached people. Everywhere running to and fro, all over on the realm, compared to swarms of insects labeled as an overflowing multitude. They were imagined in language as an effluvial uh, current. I don't know what that effluvial means. But whatever, we're gonna keep on going. Polluting and taxing English economic health. Slums enveloped London, as one observer remarked in 1608. The heavy concentrations of poor created a, a subterranean colony of dirty and disfigured monsters living in caves. They were accused of breeding rapidly and infecting the city with a plague of poverty, thus figuratively designating unemployment 
a contagious disease. Distant American colonies were presented as a cure. The poor could be purged. In 1622, the famous poet and clergyman John Dunn wrote of Virginia in this fashion, describing the new colony as the nation's spleen and liver, spleen and liver, draining the ill humor. Uh, humors of the body to breed good blood. Others use less delicate imagery. American colonies were emunctories, were emunctories, part of the organs of the body, <coughs> excreting human waste from the body's politics. The elder Richard Hallux unabashedly called the transportable poor the offals of our people. Ovos means the waste or byproduct. <laughs> the poor were human waste. Refuse the sturdy poor, those without physical injuries, elicited outrage over their idleness. But how could vagabonds, who on average migrated some 20 to 80 miles in a month, be called idle? William Harrison, in his popular description of England, in 1577 offered an explanation. Idleness was wasted energy. <laughs> the vagabond constant movement led nowhere. And moving around, they failed like the Indians to put down healthy roots and join the settled labor force of servant, tenant, and artisans. Harrison thought of idleness in the same way we might today refer to the idling motor of a car. The motor runs in place. The idle poor were trapped in economic stasis. Waste people, like wastelands, were stagnant. Their energy produced nothing of value. They were like festering weeds ruining an idle garden. Wasteland then was an eyesore, or what the English called a sinkhole. Waste people were analogalized to weeds or sickly cattle grazing on the dunghill. But unlike the docile herd, which was carefully bred and contained in fenced enclosures, the poor could become disruptive and disorderly. They occasionally rioted. The cream of society could not be shielded from the public nuisance of the poor in that they seemed omnipresent at funerals, church services, on highway and byways and alley houses, and then they loitered around parliaments, even at the king courts. James I was so annoyed with vagrant boys milling around his palace at Newmarket that he wrote the London-based Virginia Company in 1619, asking for its help in removing the offensive population from his sight by shipping them overseas. As masterless men, detached and unproductive, the vagrant poor would acquire colonial masters. For Haluk and others, a quasi-military model made sense. It had been used in Ireland. <clears throat> so it was a quasi-military model they used to designate these poor people. And they used this in Ireland and Europe first, along with these other slave codes. In the New World, whether it's subduing the native population or contending with other European nations with colonial ambitions, fortifications would have to be raised, trenches dug, gunpowder produced and men trained to use bows. <clears throat> Militarization served other crucial purposes. Ex-soldiers formed one of the largest subgroups of English vagrants. Sellers were the vagrants of the sea and were often drawn into piracy, the style of warfare most common in the 16th century involved attacks on nearly impregnable fortifications and required prolonged sieges and large numbers of foot soldiers. Each time war revived the poor were drawn back into their service, becoming what one scholar has called a reserve army of unemployed. <clears throat> the life of the early modern soldier was harsh and unpredictable. This 
disbanded troops often pillaged on their way home. In the popular literature of the day, soldiers turned thieves were the subjects of a number of racy accounts. John Alderley, the fraternity of Vagabond, 1561, and others of his kind depicted the wandering poor as a vast network of predatory gangs. Ex-soldiers filled empty slots in the gangs as upright men or bandit leaders, coney catchers, literally bagged their booty. Their consummate robbers had as one tool of their trade the hook, which was jammed through open windows in order to steal valuable goods. Carjackings. You never hear about white people jacking cars. <laughs> These customate robbers had as one tool of theirs the hook, okay? And in proposing to ship our idle soldiers overseas, Haluk aimed to turn on men into actual coney catchers, shooting rabbits to give hearty sub substance to the American colonists' daily stew. In other words, sending veteran soldiers and convicts to America would reduce crime and poverty in one master stroke. <laughs> Whatever else their lives entailed, vagrants, children of beggars, and ex-soldiers who might be transported to the New England and transplanted unto its soil were thought to be fertilizing wasteland with their labor. Their value was calculated not in human or even humane terms, but as a disembodied commercial force. If that proposition seemed cold and calculating, it was. In death, they were, to use the operative modern phrase, collateral damage. They have more value to the realm as dead colonists than as idle waste in England. And in his grand scheme, Haluk imagined disciplined children of English beggars who survived in the colonies as nothing more than a future pool of soldiers and sailors. Planting unwanted people in an America soil meant fewer temptations to take up life of crime. Some might actually thrive in the open vagrant lands of America because surely they had no chance at all in the in the overpopulated labor market back home. Still, one cannot resist the conclusion that the children of the poor were regarded as recycled waste. Their destiny, only these same folks were bred up as soldiers and sailors, was to fill out a colonial reserve army of waste men to be sent to die in England wars. Brutal exportation was the modus operandi of the English projectors who conceived an American colonial system at the end of the 16th century before there were colonies. <clears throat> and I must stop here because this is a long chapter. And I'm going to start a new chapter. <clears throat>